also like to thank the sponsors for today's event, um, Department of History, Center for International Relations, and Center for International Social Science Research. And most of all, I want to thank Tony Hopkins for coming here today. It's a real pleasure to have him here. Tony is the Smuts Professor of Commonwealth History Emeritus at Cambridge and the former Walter Prescott Webb Chair in History at UT Austin. Um, his accomplishments are far too numerous for me to list them here, but I would be remiss not to mention a few of his major publications, both for their own sake and for the way in which they point towards the project he's discussing today. He is the author, first of all, of An Economic History of West Africa, a groundbreaking book that is still a go-to volume 45 years later. And how many academics in any field can say that? Um, books tend not to last like that. Um, he is also the author with P.J. Kane of first of British Imperialism, Innovation and Expansion in 1993, and then British Imperialism, Crisis and Deconstruction, eventually brought together in a massive single volume called British Imperialism, 1688 to 2015. And those books represented a really remarkable synthesis of what is obviously an enormous subject. But unlike some volumes of that scale, where people seem to think, I've brought this much together, I've done my work, Kane and Hopkins gave us more. They gave us a strong, unifying, analytical thread through that mass of material, one that centered on what they called gentlemanly capitalism and which proved so fruitful a concept that within a half a dozen years, there was an entire volume of essays published devoted entirely to debating it. By focusing on the city of London and on what we would today call business services, credit, insurance, trade, shipping, and so on, and the ways in which that kind of wealth, um, rather than challenging the landed elite, or at least a portion of it, made common cause with it, the book focused attention on the subset of British capitalists who were actually most successful in gaining power and status, and thereby moved us beyond the obsession with industrialists and industrialization that had been central to so many earlier analyses of the economics of the British Empire and indeed of Europe's relation to the wider world. And also by tracing the way that the interests of these men were interlaced with those of other elites and with those of the fiscal state, the book gave us new ways of thinking about connections between Britain's domestic transformations and its empire. And that was important, among other things, because it gave the book a protagonist, which we could see at the center of politics through the very long haul from 1688 to the end of the 20th century. Like all books with bold theses, the book has had its critics too. But nobody, I think, could deny it is one of the most important and stimulating interventions in British imperial history in the last half century. And given the scale of that subject, that makes it a major contribution to global history as well. Indeed, Hopkins has always thought about history on a world scale. And when what some have now called the global turn in the humanities and social sciences came about, he was right there, producing, among other things, the important edited volume, Globalization and World History, in 2002, which took globalization as a collective historical product seriously. By which I mean that it first, first that it looked at globalization as a process that began long before 1945, much less 1989, which is when some social science accounts like to date it, and indeed looked at it as something that had been there even before the emergence of the major Western colonial empires. And secondly, in doing so, it moved beyond using globalization as a synonym for the rise of the West and the spread of Western ways of doing things, to instead look at various kinds of convergence that resulted from vectors that had originated in many, many places. And so that's what I meant by saying that it took globalization 
as a collective historical product seriously and really moved that discussion, I think, beyond where it had been in very important ways. At the same time, neither Hopkins nor any other good historian would deny that there are some new things under the sun. The task, of course, is to put both continuities and discontinuities together rather than making either the whole story. And that brings us to this, to the book that we will hear about today, American Empire of Global History. Itself, both a new direction in Hopkins's work and a continuation of ideas he's been exploring for a long time. Moving into US history was a new direction, and one I would note that few of us would attempt well into our careers, given the enormous literature to be read and the number of people protectively hovering around that turf. Um, but there's much here also that reverberates with Hopkins' other work. The mastery of a very long time span and the insistence that that long time span gives us a critical perspective. Um, the rejection through the use of that long time span of any neat division of US history into colonial, national, and imperial periods, so that empire making is intertwined with nation making rather than being separate. And any number of astute connections and parallels to other empires, especially the British Empire, which the US has at times both contrasted to itself, but also claimed as its predecessor. And also, again, to a broader and longer process of globalization, which has both produced and been produced by many empires simultaneously. And part of the joy of this book is that, yes, it's a book about the American empire, but you can't read it without watching the other empires weave in and out of the story in ways that if you are, as I am, a historian of a different set of empires, makes you sort of stop every now and then and say, oh, gee, yeah, I hadn't quite thought of it that way. And now I see it. Because of this larger perspective, American exceptionalism as an ideology takes a beating in this book, but without denying that, of course, there are many distinctive elements of the American way of empire. And as he always does, Hopkins moves back and forth between big themes and an astonishing wealth of really crisply rendered particulars. It's a book I'm nowhere near finishing yet, but that I can see is going to keep me thinking on every single page. And so that we can all begin getting a foretaste of this important work, please join me in welcoming Professor Anthony. Ken, thank you very much for that mellifluous introduction with its typical generosity. I was sitting there getting quite comfortable and your summary of my book uh, was better than I could have given it myself. I regret only that you haven't finished quite <laughs> everything because you could have continued for 35 minutes with, I'm sure, greater clarity than I can myself. I now have a dilemma because if I sit down, uh, which will help my elderly knees, uh, you may dominate me, which won't do at all good for my confidence. <laughs> On the other hand, if I stand, I may not be able to consult my text. A halfway house is not physically possible. Uh, so I think I will sit down because I don't like there to be a text waved in front of you. And I hope you can still see me, and uh, there seem to be twice as many of you in the room now than there was a few minutes ago. <laughs> it is a really great pleasure to be here. This little tour, the US leg of my Farewell World Tour, you may have noticed that Elton John is starting his tour in New Zealand. I say no more, it took a lot of negotiation, uh, but he did give way to me. And this tour is, of course, partly to express my profound gratitude to Princeton University Press, who've been absolutely fantastic in the production of my book. It's also got a personal slant to it, because I may not make this tour again. And I wanted to meet some old friends and express my appreciation of scholars whose work I admire, 
uh, some of whom I'd never met or even corresponded with. So, for instance, meeting Lou Perez, the famous Cuban expert at UNC, was just a real thrill. And today, of course, uh, I mustn't embarrass our host, whose fame is well known, uh, but uh, Ken is one of my heroes, and to be here, uh, good, I have embarrassed him, uh, to be here uh, with him briefly, and we had a stimulating discussion over lunch even about his current work, which has set my head buzzing, is a great privilege. And also, late, to just come into the room, my old friend uh, Ralph Austin, who is the real Africanist, uh, and uh, also a figure of great stature in that field, and a wider too. Now, as Ken said, I'm going to try to uh, indicate some of the main uh, signposts for my study. Uh, I won't waste time with a lot of uh, uh, apologies. Those things can be really rather boring. But I should just ask you, and I don't need to persuade you, uh, to accept that this is going to be crude, even by the standards of someone who's made a mastery of superficiality, as I have myself. So I'm going to miss out huge tra tra tranches of themes and subjects, uh, and you may ask me about them or uh, object to the omissions uh, when I finally stop. I did ask for three hours, but we've cut it down a little bit. So <laughs> I'm hoping to deliver you reasonably on time. If I have 45 minutes, we should be done by about three o'clock, which will allow you plenty of time uh, to uh, execute me. <laughs> so what I've tried to do uh, as an outsider is not to attempt to write uh, the history of the United States. I must make that clear. It would be a foolish undertaking. I've tried to put a slightly different slant on some familiar themes in international relations. That has, of course, carried me into US history, and I've been fully stretched in attempting to, I won't say master, but say not too many inaccurate things about those aspects of US history that I have gathered into my essentially external view. The principal argument, if I summarize it in a sentence, is that the United States has been part of what I broadly call a Western imperial system for the last three centuries, at least down to the 1950s. We'll come to that later. I'm using the word imperial in that sentence, not in any pejorative or a way of approval, but just as a description of a very important uh, historical process. My book has three building blocks which carry the empirical data, which also determine the chronology and the division of the chapters. The first is the history of globalization, which you may well think, since we're well into the global turn, in fact, we've revolved around it several times now, is flogging a dead horse into life. There is an oddity about the literature which we historians have constructed and failed to construct about globalization, and that is that we still do not have a developed historiographical debate about whether there were phases or stages of globalization or whether it was one small thing which, like acorn into oak tree, got bigger and bigger with stops and starts. And my view, which I've expressed before, but I hope I've improved somewhat since that initial uh, um, foray, is that globalization can, in fact, be divided into phases. And I have three phases for you, which will be the, the central uh, sections of what I have to say. So the history of globalization. The second building block is the process of a dialectic. That is to say, one phase uh, develops in such a way as to throw up forces which may uh, have play a part in uh, transforming and sometimes overflowing that phase uh, leading to the next one. And finally, the third building block, if you prefer assumption in this case, is that empires were the prime agents of globalization during this period not the sole agents. This is where I'm cutting through lots of important complications, but were, I think, the prime agents. 
So I want in, in, in that way to give you a chronology and you'll see at once that if I'm using the term American Empire, uh, we've got two phases that are reasonably well known. It's indisputable that the mainland colonies were part of the British or English Empire before 1783. It has also become very popular to refer to the United States as an empire after 1945. But what about the long period in between? What I want to try to show is that if you look at US history, its international relations aspects, from the perspective of somebody who knows something about empires and decolonization, you will see, I hope, there is a very good case for including the period between 1783 and, shall we say, 1941 or 1945 in uh, the story that, uh, of, of empires and of an American empire. Well, my first phase, and I should say, can I now speak with some confidence, uh, which is very rarely the case with me, I am now going to talk about my first phase, and you'll see immediately that I'm only going to say things that are very familiar to you, and I have confidence in this, uh, simply because all I've done is to put together bits and pieces and shake a kaleidoscope, it's nothing new, it's just a way of gathering together things that we know very well. The first phase, which I call proto-globalization, I will go over rather quickly, but it's not because it's not important. I've tried to give each phase its, its due chronological and other analytical importance. But for shortages of time, I don't want to say too much about it. So I refer here to a phase, at least in Western history, uh, which will be familiar to you. This is a phase when economies were agricultural, though they developed commerce, handicrafts, no machine produced uh, manufactures, and this was complemented by dynastic states. And as we know uh, from early, the, the work of early modern historians, uh, the, this, uh, this type of state uh, developed from the 16th century, and especially the 17th and 18th century, into what is called, referred to as a military fiscal state, with all its various varieties. And among the many drivers of this, of this movement, which was essentially a movement towards centralization linked to tax gathering, was of course the gunpowder revolution and the implications it had for the costs of coercion and the costs of defense. And I argue in the book that in the late 19th century, and especially after the Seven Years' War of 1756 to 63, uh, the military fiscal states of Europe uh, joined together. They converged in having a fiscal crisis as the costs of warfare exceeded the anticipated returns. Don't they nearly always, and how slow we are to learn from our experience. I have one or two quotes just to kind of change the level of analysis from the lofty and superficial to indicate that there are ways in which there are feet still on the ground here. Here is Montesquieu, already in 1748, before the Seven Years' War. A new distemper has spread itself over Europe, infecting our princes and inducing them to keep up an exorbitant number of troops. It has its redoublings and of necessity becomes contagious. For as soon as one prince augments his forces, the rest, of course, do the same, so that nothing is gained thereby but the public ruin. And there are many such observations, but Montesquieu was, I think, an especially perceptive and authoritative observer of his times. And as we know, too, uh, this phase was not merely a fis only a fiscal crisis, it was complemented uh, by the rise of reformist and radical movements seeking transparency and accountability in governments everywhere. We know this particularly with the great imperial powers it was becoming of Britain. And so, uh, this is going to be crude, and so this is for me, and I'm not alone in this of course, the background uh, to uh, the discontent that led to the America, the, main, the revolution in the mainland colonies. Is there anything new about this? I think there is. This is not just a story of taxation without representation conducted as a dialogue between a ruling power and its dependencies. This is a story that goes to the foot of the basis of the rationale of the military fiscal state across Europe. We also have 
a much broader or more uh, authoritative account of the global dimensions of this crisis insofar as recent work by uh, one colleague of mine at Austin, James Vaughan, which is going to appear later in this year through Yale University Press, has focused upon the crucial political changes of the 1760s and shown to us how the debates in the British Parliament among British politicos shaped policy and ideas about how to approach uh, the government of colonies that were to reverberate through to the mid 20th century. Basically, there was a division between what you might call those who wanted an extractive empire, Grenville, Butte, North, and on the other hand, from the Tories and Conservative Whigs, and on the other hand, from the progressive Whigs and radicals led by Pitt and others, you have the view that what we should really be doing is to increase trade and generate revenue from trade. So you have these two views, which as I say, if you look at the history of India in the 19th century, come into the 20th century, can be summarized as those between a policy, a developmental policy, and a predatory policy. So this was a crucial turning point in the formulation of these ideas. And as we know from this work and that of another fine young scholar, Justin Du Rivage, we know that this led to a revolution in the control of the East India Company in which the extractive, the advocates of an extractive policy put their man in place, sanctioned the invasion of North uh, East India, with the hope of not only capturing the Nawab's treasuries, but through the Diwani, the grant of rights, other, other areas, that this was to solve the domestic economic problem in Britain. And that looked promising, but when it failed, there was only one alternative, and that was to batten down on the mainland colonies, which is what happened. So you have in this just an extension and a confirmation of many themes uh, that are are quite well known, but I think the point is worth making. Now, after 1783, I've come to what I hope is a more interesting uh, set of observations. After 1783, there comes a parting of the ways. Uh, historians of the United States, by the time they fought the Revolutionary War and had all those battles over the Constitution just after then, then, of course, uh, uh, then what happens is they're exhausted and they give way. They've been writing history and participating in it since 1607. So you have a completely new set of historians takes over and they steer a national history or create a national history after 1783 going down to the First World War, where they then hand the baton to another set of specialists. And this is very understandable because it's what happens in all newly decolonized states. They all want to write their own history, and the inference is they all want to minimize the old imperial connection. That happens from Nigeria to New Zealand, and it first happened uh, in, with a major country in the United States after 1783. And actually, this is rather complemented by the uh, move in the imperial historians of the time, because they too specialize. And once you get to 1783, you know they've had to suffer the defeat of Yorktown. They too are really feel embattled in every sense. But fortunately, the imperial historians can retreat from the mainland colonies, which is exactly what they do, because, of course, they've got India to control. That's going to cut out a lot of time. And then the settlement in Australia, and then the French wars, Britain has acquired the Cape Town, Singapore, etc. There's a big imperial expansion story going on elsewhere. So you have this rather congenial parting of the ways. Now what is odd about it is this. If you look at the debates on decolonized states in the 19th, especially the 20th century, you will find that there is a great disagreement about whether a state and how you define a state of independence. Roughly speaking, you can distinguish between formal and effective independence. Formal independence is the changing of the flag and perhaps of the guard at the top, of course, and maybe a new national anthem if you're in the right era. Effective independence 
involves the regaining or acquiring of elements of sovereignty sufficient to give, no state is independent fully, well, but if sufficient to give that state leeway in its dealings with other powers. And so you want to establish control over foreign policy, over defense, over education, economic, and so on. Now, if you look at it that way, it's quite clear that 1783 was um, indisputably a shift from colonial to formal independence. But if you ask the question, how much effective independence was conferred at the same time, you do at least have questions to answer. And I don't think that those questions have been put with sufficient um, I won't say authority, in a sufficient way uh, to enlist or engage scholars into inquiring further into them. And when you further reflect that what you have in 1783 is really a polity consisting of settlers who then were very largely still from the home country, you can see that the creation of independence was really the more difficult, not least because one wing of the independence movement under the banner of Hamilton was attempting to export, transship, and implant elements of the very fiscal, military fiscal state that was in question back in Britain. And more than that, secular societies, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, etc., secular societies have a further difficulty in that, culturally speaking, as I mentioned, their ties with the home country are still very strong. So the creation of what the books call, the decolonization refer to as counterculture, is much more difficult. So if you start from that position, I think, and I'm going to gabble here, I think you can reframe some of the classic debates between Hamiltons and Hamiltonians and Jeffersonians in the context of a search, not so much for liberty and democracy, though that is always there, but as a search for viability and development in a situation in which it is recognized that the ex-colonial power still has a strong influence on the newly independent state. So what you can see there, it enhances the, the familiar debates about whether uh, the United States should go from manufacturing with subsidies and under the American system with protection, or whether, on the contrary, independence was to be guaranteed uh, by a set of republic, agrarian republics, etc. Under the economic heading, it is quite extraordinary, it seems to me, that the Atlantic complex, which historians of the 18th century have done so much to put in place with this whole cobweb of connections, not just across the Atlantic, but north and south and so on, seems to have disappeared or dissolved by the time you get to the first half of the 19th century. It's very hard to find, I'm speaking with total exaggeration, I know that, but I'm trying to make a point in limited time, so forgive me as much as you can. It's very hard to find anything that complements the work on the 18th century in the first half of the 19th century. It comes back, of course, a bit in the late 19th century. And this is very odd. Here's Bentham speaking in 1792 or thereabouts at the time when there was a debate in Britain, have we, have we really shot ourselves in the foot in losing the colonies and our trade's going to decline? Here's Bentham saying, all these people say this, let's look at the facts. Has our trade declined? No, he said, on the contrary, it has grown considerably. That was in 1792-3. And remember, of course, you were just at the beginning of a huge expansion of uh, overseas trade, particularly with Britain, of course, with cotton and so on from the 1820s. Not only that, within a remarkably short period of time, uh, the city of London was helping to finance the creation of the state bearings with the Louisiana Purchase in 1802, or was it 1803, and then subsequently helping to fund the state governments 
just as it did with the Latin American republics. And the British Navy, of course, on hand to make sure that any ideas of recolonization by foreign powers, uh, which had had a foothold, was going to be ruled out. So the defense costs were zero, close to zero. So the political debate can be thought about in a, in a fresh way, and the economic uh, elements of a continuing and strengthening relationship need to be uh, uh, emphasized to a degree that they have not. And if I look uh, at the other aspect, of, which is very important for consideration of effective independence, cultural independence, and this is a huge story and I can only just touch the kind of high culture, but I suppose the landmark statement during this time was by Emerson in 1837, when he made this declaration of literary independence, which really created a, a great interest among the literati of the East Coast. But this was an ambition, not a reflection on an achieved reality. And it reminded me of the wonderful phrase invented by the Australian commenter, Philip, commentator Phillips in the 1950s of cultural cringe. A wonderful phrase to express the deference which a, a, a formerly decolonized state, especially if it was stopped by settlers, was still inclined to show uh, to the former colonial power. Tocqueville is full of the same sentiment. And this is what you would expect. What's striking about it is not that it would be unusual in the new United States in the first half of the 19th century, but it may raise an eyebrow to think that this was still a real debate in Australia in the 1950s. So there is a parallel development with a chronological slide there that is worth pondering. In short, the counterculture had not been established at that time, nor was it to be for some time. And just in case you think, sure you don't, that this is a mere retrospective imposition on, a, on the past. Here is Henry Clay in 1820. Britain's aim, he said, was to maintain the United States as, quote, independent colonies of England, politically free, commercially slaves. Twelve years later, he still had to be convinced that the U.S. had broken free from what he called the British colonial system. And I'll just give you one more of these. Henry Carey, the foremost economist of the mid-19th century, Lincoln's economic advisor, thought that the version of free trade advocated by Adam Smith, if adopted, which of course eventually it was, would lead, quote, substantially to the recolonization of these states under the commercial dominion of Great Britain. The route to independence, Carey thought, lay in creating the conditions through protective tariffs which would shelter infant industries in the home country. And an aside which I can't restrain myself at the expense of an additional minute, and that is that Frederick List in 1841 published his famous National System, which became a bible for development of late start countries on the continent and actually entered then subsequently into arguments which you'll still find contested by the World Bank about how to develop uh, ma in manufacturing in very, very late start ex-colonial countries. So this is very significant. And of course, List spent a lot of time in the 1820s in the United States, a very formative period for him. And he was familiar with the whole notion of an American system. So what you see here is a neglected opportunity to underline the real distinctiveness of the US during this period, which is, as the first major example of a newly decolonized country, struggling across these three dimensions, political, economic, and cultural, to formulate policies, some of which, as I've hinted, were those later adopted by imperial policies and by nationalist leaders, often without knowing their origins. There are just two more points I want to make on this phase, and that is to say that 
there is still a parallel here with what's happening in Europe. Because Europe, after the French Wars in 1815, was also struggling to work out what kind of state system would replace the Napole Napoleonic Empire. So you have there illustrations of what you might reasonably call anti-colonial movements going through much the same considerations as were taking place uh, simultaneously in the US. And the second point is that you see in, the, in Europe a battle crudely between conservative and progressive forces as to what should happen, what kind of a state should be built, and you see elements of that in the United States without the crudity of calling the North progressive and the South regressive. You can see elements, especially from the 1830s with the abolitionist movement, the temperance movement, educational movements, and so on, of a contest there. My final quote is uh, William Seward, 1853. I think this is a most perceptive judgment on the past 75 years. The War of Independence, he observed, was the first act in the great drama of decolonization on this continent. Now, decolonisation, as I understand it, was invented in the 1830s but in the French debates over whether to go into Algeria or not. I don't know of an earlier reference, but it doesn't matter too much. The point is that this experienced and astute observer saw what many of us have failed to see subsequently, that looking back on that period, it is in fact a drama of decolonization. I now turn to my second phase. Be assured the third phase is very brief which I'm calling modern globalization, 1850 to 1950. There you are. I am full of leaden originalities. It's not a romantic title, I know. But it serves its purpose of just summarizing what, again, is fairly familiar. What is happening from the middle of the 19th century and really through a, a, more or less for another century, and that is the creation of an industrial fabric to society, modern powered, uh, uh, powered in, um, manufacturing, and also the creation in the place of dynastic states of some form of representative, what's loosely called constitutional government. Now, this really then is something we take for granted, but we just pause here. If I wrote really big history, I would be able to just give you a sentence or two about how the, the, the significance of this in world history. Because what we're seeing is a transition that had never happened before. Town and country had always had this complementary relationship, symbiotic relationship. But what happens from the late 19th century is a shift. This battle is resolved in favor of industry and modern towns, etc. The land by 1914 is more or less defeated. I just emphasize that point very crudely because what's going on here in an uneven way is an extraordinarily fraught development from the transition from what I've described to what was going to appear in the 20th century. And if you think of the United States during this period, and if you look at the truly excellent books of the period, and leaving aside, you know, the stuff on the gilded, the reconstruction, gilded age, progressives, and so on, for the moment anyway, you can see that this is also a story of nation building after 1865. It's also a story of the rise of modern industry and urbanization and so on. But the problem is that story is normally told as if it is bounded by one large country. But actually, what is happening in the US is paralleled by what is happening in Europe. And all I'm suggesting is we need to make these linkages very explicit. So think of the 1860s as a decade of state building and the attempt to create nation states out of that state building process. Germany, 1870, 71. Italy, between 1860, 1867. Reforms in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, 1867. 
um, the reforms taking place in France after the defeat of Sedan in 1870, the Meiji Restoration even in Asia 1868, and even the laggardly, slow-moving, tortoise-like British found themselves passing a real reform act in 1867, which widened the franchise and posed the problem as one conservative politician put it, what are we to do now? And his answer was, we must educate our masters. In other words, the enlargement of the political arena posed questions of political legitimacy now that the landed order was losing its grip. Who were to be these new elites? How could they legitimate themselves since they had come up in many ways uh, without the authority, the shine and sheen of a landed uh, um, uh, authority. Well, that's one thing that's happening, and the other thing that's happening, of course, is industrialization. In the United States, in my view, this is really when the market revolution takes place, not before, the, not in the first half of the 19th century, but afterwards when you get this structural change and expansion of railroads and so on and so on. So the US is taking exactly the same course at approximately the same time as Europe. And because of that, you can see with this industrial state's development, uh, cyclical fluctuations which are transmitted from one country to another in a way that I won't call systematic, uh, that's uh, arguable, but in a way that clearly shows that both financial ramifications of a bust in one place and a panic elsewhere are connected up, and so it is uh, with industrial um, fluctuations. And this has implications for our understanding of the late 19th century appeared a great deflation. At all events, it is clear that across Europe in the 1870s, 80s, and into the 90s, this was a period when the very new states and systems of production that were coming into being were called into question. This is the time in the United States and elsewhere. Well, okay, in the United States you have the Haymarket riots and disturbances going down to the great Pullman strike. You have the formation of trade unions. You even have in the late 80s the creation of the Socialist Party. This, you have urban unemployment, you have urban discontent. Exactly the same thing, with different names, of course, is happening across Europe. So there's a problem there for the new and amalgamated ruling elites. What are they to do with this? By and large, I think there is a certain uniformity of action. They're not going to turn the clock back. That is impossible. They do not want to allow any attempts uh, to assault property rights to have a chance of success. So what is the outcome of this? It is a form of capitalism which has to be moderated. It has to have an ameliorative element to it. And so you have in Germany what's called the alliance of rye and iron, and in France the equivalent, the alliance of wheat and rye uh, and iron, where elements of the old in, uh, agrarian order and elements of the new industrial order come together. Or what uh, the Catholic Church in France is part of that, as a, quite an elaborate set of alliances are built up in order to try and hold these emerging polities together to quell discontent, but at the same time the recognition that what Lincoln called the plain man had to have a square deal. So, in, uh, after the turn of the century, the progressives, of course, start to look towards ameliorative uh, action. Teddy Roosevelt has a go at the trusts. Progressive thinking, if not policy, draws on welfare schemes from across the world, including New Zealand. And of course, in Europe, you have Bismarckian welfare policies, you have Giolitti's experiments, uh, you have Lloyd George's foundation of the welfare state at the same time. So what happens is a closing of the ranks at this time of great stress to try and hold everything together and a recognition that some form of amelioration was necessary. The other, uh, among other major expressions of these problems was imperialism. 
in the late 19th century known as late imperialism, uh, new imperialism, uh, we, you see the partition of the world uh, where it had not already been occupied, the expansion of powers that already had territory, and the involvement of new powers in the acquisition of territory. By 1914, uh, even the penguins of Antarctica had been placed under some form of international supervision. When, Gallic rhetorical question number one, when did the United States acquire its empire, its insular empire, in 1898? At the very peak, you couldn't have chosen a better date if you wanted to place the argument that I'm putting to you. At the very peak of new imperialism, the war with Spain, the acquisition of myriad islands, the most important of which Hawaii and the Philippines in the Pacific, Puerto Rico with Cuba as a protectorate in the Caribbean at exactly the same time. And I argue for exactly the same reasons. And here I just interpose something. What I've tried to do is to draw upon this idea of the uneven development of political and economic forces in Europe at this time to suggest a variety, a continuum, if you like, of motives so that some countries which were already fairly united politically and had advanced economies, Britain, had particularly strong economic motives for expanding. Other countries, for example Italy, which had almost no foreign trade and were dependent on the city of London for incoming investment and were still struggling to create a nation out of a state, had predominantly political motives for involving themselves in imperialism. I give my answer about the United States, which I will just tantalize you with and not mention, which is to place it on this continuum. By 1900 or 1914, it is quite clear, and I think that the sinking of the main will serve, as well as any precise date will serve, that is to say it's totally uh, a spurious precision, uh, for the achievement of the effective independence of the United States. By then, uh, no party is beholden to the British. The Navy has been built and is actually relatively quite powerful. Uh, McKinley in 1895 is pulling the lion's tail over the Venezuela crisis and getting a lot of political kudos for so doing. By then, American manufacturers have been developed so fast, they're even invading the old home country, as it is no longer called. And culturally, too, with the work of such writers as Whitman, Mark Twain, and my favorite American poet, Emily Dickinson, you see the vernacular coming through in a way which is entirely homegrown. William Stead, the rather perceptive British commentator observed in 1904 the old almost pathetic humility cultural cringe with which American writers listen to the criticisms of Europe has disappeared and all this was celebrated with a new flag anthems uh, veterans associations as this kind of popular upsurge in the 90s of a recognition of this new sense of nationality. And my last quote is from uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson speaking in 1901 at the 125th anniversary of the Battle of Trenton. And he drones on as academics are sometimes inclined to do, present company accepted, of course. No war ever transformed us quite as the war with Spain transformed us. There was acres of this. And then he concludes, that little confederation has now massed and organized its energies. A confederation is transformed into a nation. Now, a question I'll put to you for my advice and education is at what point before then could that sentence be, that claim be made with credibility? Now I'm nearly done. But I have to tell you about the biggest omission in the historiog in historiography of imperialism in the Western world. I hope that's right. Um, 
And that is that the empire, which was acquired with songs in the, in the corridors of Congress, with tearful singing and cheering, uh, songs were composed, poetry was written. As soon as the war is finished, it all disappears. It disappears more absolutely than the Atlantic complex disappeared in the first half of the 19th century. The last book written about ruling this insular empire was written in 1962 and published in Leiden, the Netherlands, by an American author, and I hope I've done him credit in rescuing him because it's a very fine book, not one we would write today from our perspectives, but nevertheless, it had the thoroughness of its time, the clarity of a prose with simple sentences, and uh, has much to commend it. But the point is that that was 1962. What we have now is wonderful research on individual islands, but a rarity of attempts to look across to join the Pacific and the Caribbean in, as far as their imperial experience is concerned. And in my chapters on this subject, I've tried to draw attention to actually draw on my African work to try and begin those chapters deliberately shifting from a metropolitan or Washingtonian view of the world uh, to looking at how it was how this new emerging world of colonial rule was perceived by the indigenous inhabitants and to try and bring that out. And I can't talk about that now, and I don't do it particularly well, but it's an endeavor uh, that I think points in the right direction. All I want to say about the um, insular empire is that, very roughly speaking, uh, this empire, too, had a lot in common. All the key features, there are differences, the key features in common with those of the British and French empires. The economy was the same. The export of raw materials for manufactured goods. The ideology of rule was the same. The assumption that there was a civilizing mission of which superior white men with their equally superior technology had the duty as well as the right to deliver to the world. It also had the same variety. Although this empire was small, nevertheless, in 1940 it consisted, if you include Cuba uh, as a protectorate, of about 24 million people. That's quite a lot of souls to be governed. And the interesting thing for me was to discover that although it's small, it's a microcosm of the larger empires of Britain and France. So you have a settler's empire in Hawaii. You have an empire of plantations and concessions in Cuba and to some extent in Puerto Rico. And you have an empire with much more homegrown exporters, although there were some plantations too, uh, in, in the Philippines. So you have those three things with a lot of the political and racial components that accompany them in the British and French empires also being seen in, in the US empire. It was constitutionally diverse, incorporated, unincorporated, just as the British invented all these uh, almost mindless divisions which nobody fully understood between condominiums, dominions, and so on for their empire. The administrative techniques, direct rule, indirect rule, assimilation, association, were all familiar and tried in the US empire. And the trajectory of this empire was much the same. 1900 to 1914, the attempt to, su to suppress resistance, particularly in the Philippines. The installation of an elementary framework of administration. The First World War, the first time these empires across the world were shaken uh, by discontent. The 1920s, Leonard Wood in the case of the United States exemplifies this. The 1920s, a recommitment to maintaining and re-establishing Western power. And then the 1930s, a crisis again across the empire, much more serious. The gamble on, on foreign trade, sustaining incomes and maintaining a set sort of collaboration between rulers and rule, rulers fell apart. And this applied to the US empire too. The US empire, uh, 
in, in Puerto Rico, the commissioner of police was assassinated. In the Philippines, the Sandalista risings occupied much of the 1930s. So that same discontent there was nothing special in these respects about the US empire. And finally, I have one more finally, but I'm trying to encourage you. And finally, uh, what you have is that by 1945, this empire, this empire was no longer sustainable, and you had a process of decolonization, which in the case of the British and French empires, roughly speaking, ran from 1947 to the 1960s, and in the case of the, Euro of, of the American empire, Philippines 1946, Puerto Rico became a commonwealth in 1952, Hawaii was incorporated as a state in 1959, and the one that got away, Cuba, of course, uh, dispensed itself from its quasi-imperial shackles in 1959. This chronology fits exactly the chronology of the major European empires. So now we come, and this is my final finally, you'll be very glad to know to what I'm calling post-colonial, you can ask me about it if you wish, globalization from 1950 to the present day. Why did all this happen? What was it that led to, in the second half of the century to the kind of world that you, I can certainly recognize and you, most of you still read about in books, our world? There was a transformative shift in the character of globalization. World opinion shifted. The United Nations became, it wasn't the intention, but it became in the 1950s a forum and also a police act for policing rights that had been agreed internationally. These were not just civil rights, they were human rights. That is to say the right to education, to welfare, as well as to the vote. This was a revolution, big argument about it of course, but this is a major revolution which has helped to make the world that we are in today. And with it, as I've mentioned, these new institutions, much more powerful than anything before, headed by the United Nations. There was a major change in the world economy, beginning at this time and manifesting itself sub uh, in subsequent decades. Inter-industry trade, after 1945, and especially in the 50s, the developing markets were those between already developed countries, North America and Europe, North America, Europe, and Japan, North America, Europe, Japan, and now China. The old ties from one or two centers going to an outer colonial periphery were being, if not snapped, diluted. That's a mixed metaphor, the best I can do for you at this stage. There was emerging somewhat later an even more fundamental transformation, and that was, of course, the shifting of modern manufacturing away from, from the developed nations into, especially Asia, to the former colonial world. Asia today is responsible for about a quarter of world trade in manufacturers. With this came a changing geography, too. The old imperial ties that I mentioned gave way increasingly to regional associations. Uh, Australia and New Zealand now have north-south links with Japan and China, much more than they do with the old home country. The European community, NAFTA, these organizations reflect the changing direction and nature of trade. And one final change in this matter, and that is what historians of decolonization refer to as the green uprising. The Green Uprising is not the Green Revolution, that's wheat and India. The Green Uprising refers to the shift in uh, anti-colonial organizations away from a form of constitutional elite, urban-based opposition, which is quite typical of, say, early Indian National Congress from 1884 down to the rise of Gandhi, to a more grassroots, pulling in of the peasantry, that's the green uprising politically, and going down the scale in towns to a brownfield uprising, you might say. In other words, <coughs> the whole of the political organization of anti-colonial movements grew strongly. I've drawn a comparison in my book, which I mentioned very quickly, 
if you have a comparison, say, with Gandhi represents the first of the 20th century of leaders of a green uprising, you can think of this process going back to the 19th century in the United States in the shift from Adams to Jackson does, I think, indicate something similar of a green uprising taking place in the United States. I want to end, you'll be happy to hear that, with a final puzzle. And that is what I've said at the outset. Namely, just as the insular territorial empire was being decolonized, this is when the books begin to talk about an American empire. Now, we should be very careful. No one is going to argue that the United States was not a, if not the major world power after World War II. The question is, what do you call it? If you call it an empire, according to the definition I have used, which may well be vulnerable, it, an empire as I use it is a territorial empire. It has territory for reasons of integration if you wish to have export crops, if you, you will then have to change institutions, domestic institutions in the locality. You get involved with land law, uh, with labor movements. All of that involve penetration and control of the polities of the recipient countries. Now, the United States has a trillion bases. None of that is disputed. But these bases are enclaves. They are there largely, as I understand it, for geopolitical purposes and not for integrating countries economically. The countries that are economically integrated are largely those in the developed world, which are clearly not subject to colonial rule, not only because it's not feasible, it's unnecessary. So we need another name, I think. And the name I have uh, fastened upon is one borrowed from the IR theorist, simply because it's in the books and I couldn't think of anything better. It's not satisfactory, and I call the US during this period a hegemon. And more than that, I qualify it by saying it's an aspiring hegemon, but because, in my view, the so-called success of the United States after 1945 was much more qualified than books written from Washington outwards tend to assume. Well, I'm going to leave you with that, with one final remark. And if we come down to the day, to today, uh, and I'm going to be careful here to some extent, we can see that hegemons are reluctant to abandon their illusions. Aspirations tend to become more precious as the prospect of attaining them recedes. In this matter, as in so many others since the 18th century, the US and the UK continue to move in complementary if fashion. Making America great again is echoed in Brexit. Yet the age of great empires, in my view, has passed, which shows that nostalgia for hegemony is in reality evidence of the hegemony of nostalgia. <laughs> continuities and also the parallels of what's going on between America and uh, Europe particularly. Um, but that said, I have a question about the second phase um, and this almost simultaneity, if I understood this right, and maybe this is just a question of clarification, between when America becomes effectively independent and when it acquires its empire. Because it seems like that happens at exactly the same time in your narrative. Um, 
And so that led me to, and uh, uh, this emerges in the way you tell it, out of this kind of process of nation building, which is parallel in Europe, in France, and Germany, and Italy, and so on. And so this sort of slippage between effective independence, nation building, and acquisition of empire, um, where are the distinctions there, I guess, is the question. Oh, I'm sorry, I completely, the last remark, I was following in another direction. W what did you mean by what is the distinction between those three things? I didn't quite follow that, because they're yeah. all connected. Yeah, well, but it just seems to me that they all mean the same thing, maybe. Um, that the acquisition of empire is the same thing as achieving effective independence. Oh, I think I see. No, no, no. Um, right, so... The, my argument in the book, just to give you a little more detail, it's perfectly a very good question, is that um, the, it, that 1898 represents a kind of culmination of a nation building process that has been going on since 1865. The point I try to make is that the compromise of, uh, that followed the Civil War actually does not solve the problem of national unity because although some of the wounds of the Civil War have been plastered over, the new problems of an industrial state that I quickly referred to, the urban problems and so on, those then come to the floor. And as we know in the 1890s, this is a very fraught, this very fraught decade. And so what I see is 1898 pulling the state back from the brink of a, not only of a disruption, but also, as the Republicans saw it, of the disaster of Bryan, silver, and free trade. And it's 1896 which saw business get involved in politics on a mega scale for the first time. Henry Havermeyer, the founder of the Sugar Trust, was the biggest single don donor to the Republican Party in that year. And so th this, I think, shows you that uh, the business interests were very concerned that what they wanted to do was to enshrine the Republican, if you like, Lincoln-esque, uh, Republic Hamiltonian version of development, okay, which of course they did. So why they went to war was for, immediately for a political reason, in my view. They wanted to dish the Democrats. They were under huge pressure with the midterms coming up that they had to do something because the Democrats were making a lot of headway with the claim that Cubans needed to be freed. And there was a lot of pressure put on McKinley, who didn't want to do this, uh, in order to hold the party together. But underlying, so it was a political motive immediately, but underlying this was the important keeping the show on the road that had begun to be put in place with the conversion of the Republicans to a more fully protectionist policy from the late 1880s. So I would see, and uh, I have in my book, uh, and here I have a large photo. I can show this, you can see this one. Uh, there's a wonderful photo which some scholars may know already. And here is 1898. And here's this photo of a Confederate and a Yankee general shaking hands. And behind it, uh, the blonde damsel represents Cuba, whose chains are being cut. But the significant thing is that Theodore Roosevelt, as Assistant Secretary of State for the Navy, took great care to pull out some of the Confederate generals uh, from uh, retirement and give them a stake in this expedition. And he was very conscious, and so was McKinley, of banging the drum of national unity before, during, and after 1898. So I think that 1898 can be seen as kind of sealing uh, a crisis, but also pointing towards a future of the way in which, for the next, notwithstanding Wilson's election in 18, 1913, uh, the, the, the course set. In other words, that version of capitalism being preserved, as was similar attempts being made to do the same thing elsewhere. I don't know if you want to have a look at that. Does that help you on that point? I think so, yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Somebody else? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Um, and I know this was a crude, uh, as you put it, summary of, of the book, but I'm going to ask anyway. So one of the things that uh, I 
surprised to not hear about is westward expansion, right, and acquisition of Mexican territory. Where does that fit into the narrative? Mer narrative mer okay, mer yes. Don't be too surprised. You're quite right and very kind of you to say that I threw that out along with the Civil War and a number of other things, you know. So it does have a place uh, when you buy multiple copies of my book, and I would advise it because... Uh, no, no, I, it's your help I have at, uh, at my heart here because the book is so heavy, if you pick it up one, with one hand, you're bound to have medical trouble. I would suggest that you buy several copies and keep them in different locations. But chapter five is called Wars of Incorporation. And what I deal with there is 1812, the Mexican War, uh, the Civil War. And in that, I also talk with the westward expansion. So the, the real issue for empire people of the westward expansion is how you designate the process. And as you know, uh, the, the, there, is, there is work on this, of course, but the main trend is to refer to this as, the, as, in, as an empire, empire building, and that suggests a line of continuity with 1898, and in some versions you have that sort of continuity going through. I hesitate about that, uh, firstly because it denies the significance of causes of 1898 which are specific to that event and come out of, of the industrial problems that I referred to. Those didn't exist beforehand, so I think that that minimizes an important cause. Secondly, I think you can distinguish between imperialist intentions and their outcomes. You can have imperialism of intention, which is clearly the case with all settler movements in Canada, Australia, etc., and in the Westward movement. But what is the outcome of that? Now, we have territorial governments and so on. It gets rather difficult. But my, uh, my conclusion is that what you have coming out of this eventually is a nation state and not an empire. Okay? Now, that may be wrong. Of course it's not wrong, um, but some misguided people may think it's wrong. But I think it's really important to sharpen this debate. The, the, the term empire can be used in such an amorphous way as to encompass every great power. And if I may say so, it's politically easy to slip into this because it puts you on the right side of most people who don't like empires, all right? I don't like empires, but I don't think it's necessary to take that step. And you're not taking it, because uh, I haven't let you answer anything yet. But uh, think what it does. If you call the US an empire, it validates all those books written about, are we the new Rome, you know? And this means that you can compare the US to Venice, perhaps, you know, Rome, and so Greece, maybe, and so on. So it opens up a whole bag of tricks. It seems a bit irresponsible, because clearly the structural foundations of those empires were very different from the one we're discussing. Anyway, does my answer help you a bit? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I had uh, uh, one thought that occurred to me. One what, sorry? One thought that occurred to yep. me. Uh, in, uh, I think it's kind of supplementary. Um, and then I have a, a question after that. Um, the supplementary thought has to do with uh, this period in the second half of the 19th century with industrialization, urbanization, and so on, and the eclipse of the rural elites. It occurs to me that one of the things that's going on across Europe and the United States is the complete transformation of higher education. That is, universities, this university founded in, seven, in, uh, in 1892, and a whole lot of others in the US, uh, a complete reform of the French system. The Germans were already there, in a sense. Um, the, the reform of Oxford and Cambridge, the foundation of, uh, of the red brick universities, yep. and so on. Seems to me that there's a there's a, a, a new sort of nexus yes. for creating a ruling class in a way. Yes, um, a true university education. Yes, that's that's a very good thought, and and I like it, and I'm sure it's true. Um, and I wish I'd made a bit more of it. <laughs> but I did add something which is very complementary to your astute remark, and that is that uh, this is also the time in the 1870s and 80s when professional organizations were being founded. And professional, yes. the American Historical Association, the Economics Association, Engineers Associations. And I think if I were to link this up, and if I had the benefit, you're so selfish, you should have told me all this two years ago. If I had the benefit of this thought, 
I would link this up with Weber's concept of, of a bureaucratic state as being part of the definition of modernity. Right. There's uh, a, the, the, the other uh, the, the may question. May I just add I had, something to this? Yeah. I forgot. The question I had was, oh, uh, was for the, uh, on the, the final period of the US. Yes. Um, you didn't talk about, but you probably do in the book, you didn't talk about the extent of military dominance yeah. that's been characteristic of the yeah. US empire or yeah. whatever you want to call it, yes. uh, hegemony. Yeah. Yes. Um, that is, you know, that the United States currently spends about as much as all the rest of the Quite world so. on its military. It has, uh, it has the ability to, to strike anywhere in the world, even, yes. even leaving out the, um, uh, the intercontinental missiles. Um, it has a, a, the Blue Water Navy and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and bases all over the of world. Of course, I did mention the so bases. That, that seems to me, if, if one's going to talk about an American empire, that seems, or hegemony either, that seems one of the crucial things um, that makes the U.S. rather dominant in this, this second well, half of the... Well, you know, I accept century. all that. That's absolutely right. Um, and my interpretation of that it goes along the following lines. I'm looking at this from the point of view of an empire, mm -hmm. which I don't think it is. Yes. I would ask the question, it's got all that power. How effective are they from a perspective of somebody wanting to create, build and manage an empire? Yeah. So I do think that once you yeah. ask that question, you would you might come back with some qualifications. Yes. That is to say, I mean just just look very crudely we got some very big wars, haven't we? Korean War. Well, let's call that a draw. Yeah. But it, it, it brought China into the scene and that then raised all the stakes in Southeast Asia, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Vietnam, well, scarcely a triumph of arms. Somalia, they backed the wrong people in Angola, and so on. So what I'm saying is that uh, the, the use of, of force is does make the US, for all the reasons you've given, an extremely powerful. But as for the effectiveness of deploying force in the conditions of a post-colonial order, where you will get, as Chalmers Johnson put it, rapid blowback, uh, then uh, you know one. I think we have to sort of think about yeah. the, the efficacy of that. That's all I would say. Does that help a bit? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I have a question about your depiction, I guess, primarily of the 19th century, because it's become much more fashionable these days to sort of diminish the importance of Europe in all of the histories that we write. And you seem, by contrast, you seem to be sort of putting Europe back in the center when you talk about the myriad parallelisms between European history and US history. Um, and I wonder if, which I think would probably make a US historian, which I am not, sort of more upset than I am by what you've done. And I just wonder if that's an intention of yours to sort of decenter and re to rather recenter Europe instead of the um, tendency toward decentering it, or if you would say that you are rather describing a global interdependence between the US and Europe rather than a kind of imitation or following along with European patterns mm -hmm. by the US. Thank you very much. That's, that's a, another very astute question. I think it's the last of those things. It's more an attempt to look at the interdependence. And I think the book has got much more on the US than I made, uh, than I made yeah. in my talk. But you've raised a, an, an extremely interesting point, which I was talking to Ken about over lunch. And, and that is that going around in this little tour that I'm doing, and wondering how US historians would react to what I'm doing, um, and fearing that they would feel, understandably, that this is an outsider treading on their patch. That may be the case. That hasn't actually been articulated to me, so it may be something that they think as they go out through the door. Um, I think I 
I must be careful here, but the truth is I've been very disappointed because I think what I've tried to do in my book is actually to challenge historians of the United States to, as we used to say in Austin a few years ago, think outside the box while pushing the envelope in those cliches, <laughs> in those cliches of yesteryear. And I actually do feel rather depressed because I, I don't know that they're going to do that. Uh, and, and if I may say so, um, it, it, it irritates me that U.S. is, well, here, first of all, we've got this great global turn, and there's a lot of, of, of hot air about it, quite frankly. But when it comes to it, I will get questions of the kind that, well, it wasn't like that in Missouri in 1837, or <laughs> which I understand is a perfectly reasonable question, but not always, except in this audience, not always an acceptance that there is something here that needs to be to be looked at seriously. And, and finally on this point, that so much of the of global literature which does look at Europe works with a very, with a stereotype. So that you can still see books, recent books much praised will still have things like, well, when Britain began to decline in 1870, which I mean is, that's decades out of date, you see. So what I'm trying to say is to do some credit to my European colleagues who know I've pillaged some of their work, but also presented a slightly more nuanced view of developments in Europe in the 19th century. The many stereotypes used by US historians who are trying to think outside the box of actually you. I have no idea. I hope that uh, when people get round to it, they might think that it's worth doing, but I don't know whether it'll be bypassed or not. Yes. Well, as uh, one of the, I think, the only U.S. historian in the room, or one of the few, or something here, um, I, I think if American historians want to do this. This is what America and the world is about. Whether they can succeed is another question, because exceptionalism is deeply entrenched. So I wanted to follow up on the implications of what you were saying about, um, about in the nature of independence, because that's really at the center of American thinking about its own exceptionalism. And so you have the actors' categories of self-government and democracy or an empire of liberty. And then you have the reality that the United States is building an empire you know, slavishly uh, modeled after the British Empire that it successfully supplants. You look at the end of your story and the uh, war with the Philippines, and you can look at it two very different ways, although they obviously intersect. One is to emphasize um, an independence attained through interstate relations. The United States, uh, well, sorry. A, 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 um, a power attained through interstate relations, yeah. through clashing sovereignties. But the United States is an empire among empires now. Mm -hmm. And uh, its navy and its colonial technique now stand alongside the other empires. Yeah. Yeah. Another way to look at it is westward expansion, entering a new mode, or the yes. global expansion of white settler yeah. democracy. Yeah. And those might be characterized as interstate versus globalizing yeah. ways of understanding the modes of ruling the world. Is it useful to distinguish between the global and the international in trying to account for the position of the United States so that we can avoid exceptionalism without arguing away distinctiveness? And the reason I ask that is it seems like the composition of sovereignty, how that power is constituted, is very unusual that you have a nation that declares itself independent underneath the umbrella, not a nuclear umbrella, but uh, a naval umbrella. Mm -hmm. And so it's a strange kind of sovereignty. And it, it almost gets extinguished in 1815. But eventually, even throughout much of the 19th century, if you include capital flows within that, that umbrella of trade, it's a very unusual kind of independence that we couldn't call a kind of you know, full-blown national sovereignty, at least within political economy, mm -hmm. at least till the end of the century. Then in the 20th century, you have nuclear sovereignty, and Europe is under the American mm. nuclear umbrella. Mm. So I just wonder if you could talk about how sort of the uh, patterns that aren't really about relations between nations, but are about things like race, class production, industrialization, um, how those intersect with those things that are the product of foreign relations, diplomacy, interstate relations, and. Oh. Did, it, did it explain uh, kind of the, the strange 
composition of American power, that it's... Uh, oh, there's an awful lot there, I'm yeah. afraid. And, um, well, uh, I, I don't think the U.S. is at all special in that regard. I think that the intersection in principle between the nation state and these transnational flows, if we put it that way, is in principle the same everywhere. The fact that the U.S. is a republic, uh, or France is a republic, there are lots of republics around. I, I would just back off to one thing that I do remember you saying. I think that when you were posing uh, the, at the beginning, the contrast between one view and the second one, which was it's a continuation of westward expansion, well, that actually might be a way of also answering the question you put, because to some extent, what was going on in Hawaii and the Philippines was an extension of Western settlement to the extent particularly, for instance, that the development of California had a profound effect on Hawaii, certainly, and of course was the point of departure for ships going from the US to the Philippines. So there you've got a westward expansion, but of course there's a huge constitutional difference because the US states, as they became states from territories, were incorporated on a basis of constitutional equality, whereas that wasn't a possibility for Philippines. So there you have a difference, of, a profound difference, constitutionally, which also affected many other things, because the Philippines was never going to be incorporated. And although Hawaii had the prospect, in principle, of being incorporated as a state, and was in 1959, that was fought bitterly right the way through the late 1950s. So I, I just on that point, I think we can see two things then. Firstly, there are informal flows, let's put it this way, which justify talking about a westward expansion continuing, but there is also a division to be put down constitutionally with the consequences that I mentioned because of the difference between an informal expansion and the creation of dependent constitutionally recognized empire. Well, I just want to push back one time on the, taking this notion of continuity and extending it um, geographically and not just in time, that at the same moment that the insularity or the, the, you know, the special constitutional status of the Philippines and Puerto Rico is being established, Jim Crow is also making, uh, hiving off African Americans from the American polity. Yeah. In the 60s, so that would be talked about as internal colonialism, yes. but it, that process of excluding um, sort of black labor from the polity is happening outside America and inside, and the process of then um, pulling that apart legally happens at in, in similar paces outside the United States and in the United States in the 1950s and the 60s when the military, so Correct. I just wonder if the structures of governance that you talked about to distinguish between the continent and the empire are as uh, determinative as as uh, as you're suggesting. Well, they are they are distinct, but they're not exclusive. If you see what I mean, you can have many of the same processes taking place within a within a nation. And I draw attention exactly to those two phases, as a matter of fact. And although this is tangential to your remark, one of the things that struck me as a complete newcomer is the extent to which you get to the 1950s and 60s, the literature on civil rights concentrates very largely on African-American rights. And yet there is a parallel literature, of course, on Native Americans. And yet it's in separate books. And the two things are not brought. From my perspective, these are part of a similar story. And the, the chronology is the same. The organizations spring up at about the same time. The goals are very similar and so on. One is much larger than another. So I've actually put those two together in a kind of compressed way. But I do use the term, probably wrongly, internal col colonialism to refer to that phase. Because the US, yeah, the US is actually, I'm going to say it's unique. Uh, Ralph may correct me uh, in that uh, None of the other great uh, imperial powers had the same problem of an internal uh, colonialism. We can use the phrase for the moment. The Irish. Sorry. The well, the, the Irish. Irish, I think that's a little more complicated. It is. Uh, <laughs> sorry? It is complicated. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Well, it's been, it's been, it's been, it's been, yeah, 
actually, I mean, the point graph is an excellent one, and I, this time I've made great play with the idea that colonialism begins at home uh, in Ireland and Scotland. And you've got two different modes of control there. You know, you've got direct rule with settlers in Ireland, and you've got the manipulation of Scotland through the indigenous chiefs, so to speak. Mm. Sorry, yes. I think I'm interested in something similar in terms of what we can identify in America that is exceptional, or is that, it, that is different, if not exceptional. In terms of the comments that you were making on the relationship between town and country and the agriculture and industrial orders, uh, and then now looking forward to a different kind of relationship between town and country where we have uh, waning agricultural industrial power and a new kind of financial technological uh, power, also in relationship to metropolitan colony. Um, and something that strikes me about the narrative that you gave in the American context is that all the chronology of, of the various shifts in the relationship between town and country happened so quickly in this country um, that there's a kind of trauma of dealing with the rapidity with which these things changed. Um, and perhaps there's a, a different kind of chronology in, in terms of that development in the European empires. Um, so I'm hoping that you can clarify what you think of in terms of plotting the relationship between the agricultural order, how it developed in the first place, and the shift between the relationship between urban and... and Are you talking about the 19th century now? The 19th century, definitely. So identifying for, uh, for me what was different in the chronology between the uh, British Empire and how we can see the same sort of shifts in the relationship happening in America, perhaps on a more compressed time frame, uh, and then looking ahead to now where the relationship uh, is different. Well, um, I don't want to talk about agribusiness, which was sort of on the horizon after the beginning of the, news of the last century. Uh, and I don't really, I, I don't talk about the US domestic developments after 1898. I talk about US colonial policy because from my point of view, the US has achieved its independence and that's a story that I don't really wish to get involved in. So that's a rather, rather abrupt decision I made which freed me, I think, for talking specifically about colonial policy and the forces which made that and the contest between Republicans and Democrats about that aspect of policy. But I, I mean, I don't know whether you're referring to the relationship between agriculture and industry in the domestic countries, that is US, Britain, France, or the relationship in the colonies, those are two huge subjects. Well, you mentioned that there was this conversion, a uh, uh, convergence of, you know, in Britain and France and Germany, yes. all of these people were dealing with this yes. change between the agricultural yes. order shifting to an industrial one around the same time, yes. but in the American context, of course, the, the beginning of that uh, relationship between territory and the urban centers that started to um, integrate all of that territory happened on a much faster time scale. Uh, it did? Well, I, I mean... If we're thinking of westward expansion, um, you know, Britain's territory was what, what it was. Well, I, I see. So. Well, I see. I mean, if I'm comp you're talking about broadly settled countries yes, in, in, yeah. in France and yeah. Germany and Britain yeah. and those that are expanding. Well, the comparison I make, and this is another obvious comparison, is with other countries of white settlement. So these frontiers are moving everywhere. So you get so many books on westward expansion which assume that this is something particular to the United States. Well, it is particular, but it's not unique. I mean, the, the, the details and everything are specific. But the same thing's happening in Canada and Australia and South Africa and New Zealand. And there are lots of books called Settler Colonialism, which are actually about the United States, and they just doff the cap for a page or so, sort of acknowledgement of this, a, a full sense of the comparative aspect of what's going on in the United States has not fully been recognized. I would even say the same about the wonderful work done to create and rescue Native American history from the, 18th, from the 1970s in this country. I mean, tremendous work. But you wouldn't imagine from the historiography that much of what is the, the phases of historiography of the Native American story have all been anticipated in studies of Africa and so on and so on. Uh, 
and these connections, not to speak of Maori's Aborigines, Inu, Inuit, Sami, and so on. So these comparisons have been really not developed. In that sense, I think there's even more to be got out of comparisons than I've had the chance to do. Yes, sir. Um, I want to take what I think is actually another crack at Priya's question in some ways. It seems to me, this, if you think of, it's easy to tell the story of the late 19th century as we move from the agricultural order to an industrial order. Because of course, the growth of industry is so much faster. And these old agrarian agents do have to make room for new um, industrial ones. But, no, at the same time, agriculture itself is being dramatically transformed yes, yes. in a way that I think, you know, sort of in the spirit of what you're doing, may be best seen not as a national set of national stories, but as a systemic one, right? As a, as a systemic one. Yeah, okay. One in which you have a whole bunch of places, right? The United States, Argentina, parts of Russia, Canada, Australia, where a new kind of farming is possible, yeah. right? The kind of farming that generates very large exportable surpluses, yeah. right? And is relatively capital intensive, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Um, those kinds of frontier agricultures then send goods flowing back, partly to Europe, but also to the east coast of the United yes. States. Yes. What happens? Older style farmers cannot compete, yeah. right? Many of them lose their, either lose their land, yeah. or you know, some of them then consolidate what's left yeah. behind, but some of them go to the cities nearby, some of them get on boats, yeah. go to the United States, Argentina, Canada, yeah. Australia, push the frontier back still Indeed. further, Indeed. right? Still more goods flow back to, again, not only to Europe, but to places like upstate New York, Right, but what you've got, it seems to me, you start thinking of agriculture not just as this sector that gets surpassed, yes. but this sector that is in its own right extraordinarily dynamic in yes. this area. Right, yes. you're, what you're getting is a transnational system, yes, in which the U.S. plays a, a big but by no yes. means unique role, yes, just as one of the centers of this new kind of agricultural yes. production which is destabilizing yes. rural-based societies everywhere, shaking up their politics, yes. et cetera, et cetera. So this might be one of those cases where you, rather than looking at the parallels, yes. you can sort of look at the integrated system. I think that's right. And um, I actually refer to, in, I'm not saying I cover all mm. this properly, but I do agree with you and I've seen some of it. Uh, I, I refer to, late 19th century imperialism as enforced globalization uh, because it struck me in reading some of the economists and economic historians on Europe in the late 19th century, they speak of a backlash against globalization because of the rise of protection partly to defend uh, agriculture which was suffering from competition from new sources including the United States. What they don't realize, and I hadn't realized in now I give it a new name, it does express my realization of the fact that this protectionism as, and the problems arising in the late 19th century in industry as well as in agriculture did help to push uh, imperial powers into new markets, mm -hmm. thereby creating a new wave of agricultural products and so on and so on. So to that extent, I've just seen some of what you've drawn attention to. So you're right, the agricultural story doesn't end in the way I put it. I think my, my analysis has, in, in the limited framework of Europe and so on, I think my analysis has, has validity, but the wider world is indeed drawn into this in a novel way. I mean, it remind, the other point I wanted to make, that uh, Turner's notion of the closing of the frontier in 1892 was kind of a very temporary observation, <laughs> and that, of course, the frontier opened up again with the revival of prices, and then with uh, you know, motor transport, refrigeration, and all the rest of it. 
frontier within the United States has constantly been moving and reinventing itself, which is an observation very much in, 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 in consistent with your own remark. Well, yes, sir. Uh, uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. And I was wondering if your, let's say, framework that you presented today uh, could be applied for the Islamic Empire, the Russian Empire, and the um, and the Ottoman Empire. Are these the same? They follow the same for, form of transformation, or is it different? Even maybe the Chinese Empire. You know? Yes. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's a, no, it's a wonderful question. It's just that one is, I am bereft of answers, and so I could I could plead lack of time. But uh, as as Dr. Johnson said, when an irate lady came up to him and uh, berated him for omitting omitting a word from his dictionary, when she paused for breath, he said. Ignorance, madam, sheer ignorance. I mean, <laughs> what, I, what I have to say about these things in a very short space of time would not do justice to your very good question. Ralph. But the answer to this question would be to to Fred Cooper. Yes. His big book on it. Yes. The empires are the norm in world history. Yes. And nation states are just a kind of aberration. Yes. Uh, he's very much trying to Indeed. center. You're taking the opposite stance. You're really looking at nation building. Uh, you, you see nations and then regional groupings would still depend on nations as actors and yes. as, as, as being the form of globalization. So I think your, your answer to him would be no. Okay. Quite a few. <laughs> 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 Johnson, totally different yes. Well, by proxy from my superior colleague and friend, I will say no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. <laughs> Thank you. Well, okay. <laughs> this time. Uh, another way that you seem to be a little bit differentiating yourself from Cooper and from Burbank is in this, this question of the category, the definition of the category of empire, too, because I think we've talked about a lot of very material and geopolitical terms, but if I remember, they kind of prefer a something okay, more. Up a phrase, right? Yeah, sorry, that they, they use a more value driven definition of empire as yeah. any system where you have uh, stratified citizenship yes. and where that can be mapped geographically. Quite so. And do you, f I just, in the last minutes then, do you, do you find that naive, or have you chosen to avoid it on other bases? I'm too wary to call Fred Cooper naive. <laughs> 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 um, no, all I would say on that, uh, in a slightly evasive way, but the best that I can manage, is that you put your finger on something. I mean, all arguments depend on the terms on which they rest, and that depends in terms on your definition. So if I had begun by talking about empire as is commonly discussed and apply to all world powers, it would get me out of a number of difficulties because I can incorporate everything into it. The narrower, more narrowly you draw the definition, of course, the tighter it is and it's applicable to your particular problem maybe because then you're ruling out certain things which make you vulnerable from that point of view. So their definition may well suit their very spacious conception uh, my definition is uh, very much concerned to, to describe what I see as the chief structural characteristics of the empires I've looked at in the period in question, which is a pretty big slice. And I think it has the advantage, as I've said in answer to previous questions, because it is fairly well-defined territorially, I think it will hope it will sharpen the discussion of when we use this term, and the outcome of that, I hope, will be a little bit more of a refined understanding of the problem and a little more discrimination in hurling the term around. Just this is an interesting perspective on where you came from and your and my trajectory. We both came of age in the late 50s and 60s, new nations. I was hired here as part of a project of the Committee on New Nations. So, right. So, uh, uh, and Fred Cooper, he's the, what drives him to see the empire as the norm yes. uh, is the, the, the failure, as he understands it, many other people do, of, of the new nation project in Africa, yes. national project in Africa. Yes. So I want to put it to you. I mean, you've, you've suggested that this, there is this, what you imply is a kind of universal model of modernity, which is to start out as a colony and then become a nation uh, gradually. You make a very persuasive case for the United States. 
Um, but would you, could you, does you see this happening in Africa, a parallel development <laughs> happening in Africa? Our Africa. <laughs> I mean, the question is, do I see some normal trajectory of a state of one kind becoming a nation state? Is that right? So is, it your nation, is this, this is model you trace between the United States, Britain, and you, you make some reference to the yes. white dominions. Um, do you think that this implies, uh, forget about China, I mean, that's clearly common to yourself, but for the last time, you can't say anything about it. But, what about Africa? I mean, can it, is it universal enough? Which we thought, that's in the 50s and 60s. We certainly thought we that taught. was the model for the future, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think what we have learned is that nationality is a much more a, a malleable concept than we thought before, that it can be depend on the dominance of a particular one ethnic group, if it sort of straddles the borders of the state sufficiently, or it can be a combination of diversities in a federal system and so on. So I think when we speak of nationality, the range of affiliations between very strong to the state based on a homogeneous ethnicity, well, one could think of Japan as being a good example in this case, I hope, and then of a great diversity in Nigeria, for instance, uh, then you know the whole concept of nationality becomes rather vast and flexible, and I think that's probably the slightly more refined way to look at it that we did. Well, I'll give you an example. We were in the Yes. The great model for Nigeria was Yugoslavia. Exactly. Yes. 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 Sorry, can I just follow up on Ralph's question and ask, what would you call Liberia? Is a great model in the 19th century for Americans was Liberia. And, well, the decolonizers. And so on the one hand, it's a colony, but on the other hand, it's supposed to have a constitution modeled after the United States. Yeah. And um, so I'd just be interested in knowing, like, what would you, how would you characterize what Liberia was within this typology of nations versus uh, imperial uh, territories? Um, so, I, Liberia is founded as a free state, right. okay? So by the American colonization right. society. By the American yeah, colonization society. Yeah, <laughs> with Henry Clay there, was it 1818 yeah. or something yeah. like that, yes. And partly because of the, a number, the concern about the slaves who'd escaped during the War of 1812. So, oh yeah, I'm with you on that. And there's been a very good book, too, and we don't need to know that, following that story through. Well, you put your finger on something you may not have wanted to put your finger on, but it, it, it's, and I'm glad to have a chance just to mention it, because I have not said anything about the informal empire. Now, you may argue that Liberia is not in the informal empire, to the extent that it was formerly an independent state, then the question is how much real sovereignty did it have? So, why haven't I done that? If you haven't asked me, you're too kind. And I think the answer is as follows. Curiously enough, there is an awful lot, well, a considerable amount of literature on dollar diplomacy and the informal empire, you know, after, after 1945. Informality is, is, is fairly strong there. But the actual formal territorial empire that was indisputably under US control between 1898 and the 1950s has not been studied. So one reason is the rather basic one, I'm filling a gap. A better reason is to say that once you get into the notion of informal empire, it becomes necessarily very slippy, so slippery. So it's one thing to call, you can speak of informal influence. That actually is quite a robust notion, and it's a reasonable notion. But if you start then to slip into assuming that something called informal empires are very close and just an extension of informal influence, you are then making a, a parallelism between uh, informal empire and formal empire. And that it seems to me to be pointing too strongly in that direction. And there are distinctions between the formal and the informal empires. The founders of this concept were very clear about its ambiguity. And when I used to have a drink with Ronald Robinson, this session is ending on a really disreputable note. We used to meet in the old bore opposite Trinity College from time to time to have a drink. Ronald Robinson with Gallico was the founder of this 
notion as we use it of informal empire. Economic History Review, 1953, pages 1 to 15, for those of you who haven't read it a million times. And um, I used to talk to him about this, and uh, he, was a, he was a pilot during World War II, and he said to me, he had a very hoarse voice, he said, Tony, you need to fly so high that bees can't shoot you down. So his idea was to launch this notion, and they never actually defined it very closely. <laughs> and legions of less talented scholars made careers arguing about what it meant. So there is a real problem of dealing with it. And you know, I then began to think to myself, I've got the whole of Central America, I've got Mexico in particular, I've got all these Latin American republics, and then there's Liberia, and goodness knows what. It really needs a completely different book on a, a completely fresh mind, which mine, alas, <laughs> no longer is. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, my question was building on a couple other questions. Um, yeah, can you speak up? Oh, sorry. My question was building on a couple other uh, questions about Western expansion and the nature of U.S. independence in this period. Um, as you mentioned, you know, westward expansion could be seen as a parallel process to settler colonization in Canada and Australia. But as you mentioned, I thought it was a very interesting point about there's, you, you talked about this idea of a long decolonization in the same period between the U.S. and Britain. So how do you see those two processes working together with, on the one hand, U.S. could be seen as decolonizing from the British Empire, but on the other hand, is engaging in this early colonialism. There, I mean, the largest national expansion is happening in you know, the 1840s and everything like that. Um, you mean you're talking about the Westward Movement? Exactly. Okay. Like in terms of that being a colonial process yeah. while still decolonizing. And some of it's happening at the expense of Britain, right, with the Oregon Territory and things like that. So I was just curious in your view how, the, how those two fit together, to what extent do they yeah. complement or, or... Well, I mean, it was a case of an unlicensed expansion, if you like, unlike the Canadian expansion, which was a licensed expansion via the British Empire. Uh, Burke, in the 1770s, was very concerned about this and he said if we the British don't ensure that any movement of the settlement is accompanied by agents of government we will act like Tartars defending, uh, uh, descending upon the indigenous people. He wanted to ensure as took place much more in Canada uh, that uh, the frontier moved forward in association with government but of course, in 1783, and actually offered in 1776, that frontier was moved forward largely in advance of government. So, I mean, it's a very strong aspect in the motivation for independence uh, that this pro process could take place. And so in that sense, there is a similarity of expansion everywhere of, of colonization in the Greek sense, the taking up of land in the Greek sense, but in the case of the US, it was not regulated and directed from an imperial center after 1783. So I think it's quite, quite consistent with the idea that a new state, which is a decolonizing state, uh, has these expansionist tendencies and sees them, among other things, as contributing to its, uh, to its strength and hence to its independence. We have reached four o'clock. Um, um, Professor Hopkins will still be here for a while. There are books outside to be purchased and yes. autographed. Um, but I think, first of all, we owe him a round of applause.